I am going to do something that I haven't done in over two years, and that's making something for someone else. So before starting this YouTubing journey, which has been going on for about two years now, or more like exactly just over two years, <laughs> I used to do commissions for people, and since I started YouTubing, I have not done any of that. It's been completely my projects for this channel, and that's it. But I have a project that I need to get shipped out very soon, and so I need to make it. So this project came about because I had a commission like three years ago, maybe, that got canceled because of some circumstances, and I ended up having a half-finished Alice in Wonderland dress. And I've been trying to sell that partly finished dress with a custom-made bodice, because that's the part that hasn't been made yet, and I've been trying to sell it, and it finally sold at the end of last year, and now I need to actually make that bodice, and I thought it would be the perfect time to talk about how that bodice is made. Because I do have a video featuring the finished dress on this channel, and I have had a lot of comments like, when are you gonna share about the making of this dress? But the thing is, when I made that dress that's in that video, I was 16 and hardly knew anything about what I was doing in the future, especially YouTubing, so I did not take any videos of that process. I took some photos, but that's it. So. I'm going to share the process of making the Alice in Wonderland bodice, and I'll also kind of walk through the process of creating the skirt, though I won't have any visual representation of how of making that skirt. So we're just going to go for it. But when I first made the first Alice in Wonderland dress, so completed, all the way finished for my size, was back in 2016, and my sister-in-law was having an Alice in Wonderland themed birthday party, and here's where I realized that I'm just as spontaneous with my projects as I am now. Like three weeks before her party, I was like, hey, I should make a costume for this party. Yeah, and I did, and then I ended up buying an embroidery machine in order to finish that project. So it was kind of a, it was a long process of um, figuring all that out, but also, that's kind of selfish of me, right? I mean, like, you're having a birthday party, she's having a birthday party, and I'm gonna make a costume for myself to wear to that party. But, you know, it's fine. She eventually wore it like a year later for fun. But anyway, here is this original Alice in Wonderland dress. This is in my size, the very first one I made when I was 16 and we have a bodice and we have the skirt which has this lovely embroidery which was all designed by me well not designed i copied the original and turned it into an embroidery pattern which i can't believe i figured out how to do that at 16 when i knew nothing about digitizing and pe like patterns for embroidery machines i didn't know anything about embroidery machines until i bought one for this project but anyway, I have decided to digitize the pattern like fully so that it's workable for other people and I am selling that. So you can find the link for this embroidery design down below in the description. And then we have a striped silk taffeta petticoat, which all of these parts of the dress, I did extensive research on the original down the hole, as I call it, blue dress that Alice wears and I researched so much on this project and I tried my best to get it as accurate as possible and I'll walk you through some of those details that I discovered and why I'm doing it on this replica that I made. For now, we're gonna focus on the bodice. And thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. With Skillshare, you can turn 2022 into a year of learning and exploring new interests. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring and creative classes for anyone who loves to learn. 
And seeing as this is a sewing channel, this is the perfect time to mention a class that the one and only Bernadette Banner has put on Skillshare. She is such an excellent teacher and sews amazing things, so this class is the perfect place to start if you're interested in learning sewing yourself or if you just want to get better at those sewing details. The first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in my description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare and you can start exploring your creativity today. So one of the main unique things about the bodice is this sort of two dimensions that we've got going on with the fabric. You have this lower part of the bodice, which is the non-sheer part, and then up top and around pretty much the whole neckline, you've got a sheer bit going on. And then you have this lace detail, button detail, and then also you've got some um, lace edging that's on the edge of the um, non-sheer part of the bodice. You have that on the front and back. So you're almost creating a strapless look with the non-sheer part of the bodice, and then you've got sheer fabric creating the straps and sleeves of the rest of the bodice, if that makes sense. So what's happening with the fabric is I've got a poly taffeta making this part of the bodice up. And then there's a full layer of silk organza making up the overlay of the bodice and this top sheer part. So that's creating like unity almost between the solid part of the bodice and the sheer. This one layer of organza is kind of combining it all together. And then we've got this edging here, which is a, um, can't think of the name right now, but it's lace that's got holes in it so you can weave ribbon into it and tighten it up and such. So we've got that edging going along here that then has some satin ribbon going through it. And then we have this detail, which is just a netting type fabric, English netting. And then I've sewn on these little flower embroidery pieces, hand sewed them all on along the edge. And then we have some navy ribbon satin going through those flowers to kind of scrunch it up. And last but not least, we've got these buttons, which I found replica buttons. And I don't know if they're still available, but I will try to find that and put the link down in the description. But they're shell buttons with this amazing flower etching going on in them and there are 14 of them going along the bodice. So those are the main details that we've got going on here. But then we also got this piping. We have this piping along the front seam, along the armhole, the back seams, and then also one along the waistline. And then we've got the sleeves, which have this sort of smocking detail at the shoulders, then three pin tucks, and then a scrunched up with elastic bit for the, the hem of the sleeve. And then also we have a bit of Swiss dot netting, which is inside the sleeve. So a lot of little details make up this bodice that in the long run aren't actually too hard to make. It's just a matter of finding the right thing to create that detail and then kind of just going from there. Before going on to actually making this bodice, just talking about a few of the extra things you need besides fabric is this edging lacing that's got some loops in it so that the satin ribbon can be fed through it. Um, I will put the link where I found this down below, but I do not know if it's still available. Same with this. But um, yeah, you just basically need a basic loop looking lace edging. And then for the flowers along the neckline, I had the hardest time finding little applique, applique type things or lace modifs, whatever you want to call them, to create that edging. I couldn't find anything that was similar and that small and just not poly, poly looking. And I ended up finding this lace, which I don't know how I came upon it, but it has the flowers inside the lace and then I cut them out to create all the little flowers along the edge. Talk about a little bit of a time waster. But in the end, it was actually cheaper to have buy just like yardage lace, which you then cut apart to create the little flowers, then trying to find little flower 
things that are already cut out and ready for you to sew on. So I'll show the process of cutting that out, but those are the two laces that really help create the whole thing and bring it all together. And then also the buttons, which are amazing, and I will put the link down below if they still sell them. Also, I do have the pattern available for this dress, and I will put the link down below and up above. The first step in this process was to adjust the pattern to the correct size of my customer. I first traced my original pattern and then made the adjustments to that flat pattern, and then I created a mock-up. Once the sizing was correct for that, I now need to place the line, which will indicate the difference between the sheer part of the bodice and the solid part of the bodice. Once that's been placed, I'm cutting out the pattern and tracing it back onto paper. I have not cut along the drawn line yet. So this first pattern piece is the full organza piece. Now I'm tracing the pattern again, but before finishing the pattern, I'm cutting at the drawn line. Now I'm going to finish up tracing it, and this piece is my taffeta pattern piece. And then the smaller piece, which was cut off, is traced, and that's the little under layer of silk organza. All the pieces do not include seam allowance, so this just makes it easier with all the trimming off and such that I'm doing. When I go to cut out the actual fabric, I'll just need to remember to add the seam allowances to all the edges. Moving on to the assembly, the first step is to create a full pattern piece for the front and back, which includes solid taffeta pieces and the small organza pieces. But before connecting those, I'm going to place a bit of lace along the edge of the solid piece. Now that the lace has been secured in place, I'm now going to attach the silk organza piece. After giving it an iron and making sure the seam allowances are all folded behind the solid fabric, I now have full pattern pieces of both the front and back pieces, and we're going to place the full layer of silk organza on top and get it basted together. And then for the side pieces, they're just a layer of taffeta fabric and organza basted together. Before sewing the bodice together, we first got to make some piping, which will be placed in most of the seams. This is just made of bias cut strips of taffeta and then sewed with some cotton cording in the middle, and I'm using an invisible zipper foot for this. In order to achieve an even amount of piping showing through the seam, I first place the piping on the right pattern piece of the seam, and once placed, I get this basted in place. The basting is not just going to keep the piping in place as I sew the final seam, but it's also going to give me a guideline. As I flip the piece over and pin the seam together, you can see that the stitch line is visible. As I sew this seam, I'm going to sew just beyond that visible stitch line, and I don't want the basting to show through on the seam, so that's why my needle is just evenly sewing to the side of that stitch line. You could also remove this basting stitch if you wanted. I don't think it's quite necessary, so I just leave it, and that's why I'm doing it this way. And the result of this is a nice, evenly piped seam. By the way, the only seams which don't have the piping is the very side seam and the top of the shoulder seam. To finish off the neckline, I am placing the lace edging and sewing that in place. This seam is then trimmed and then ironed, folding the raw edges in. 
And then I did a top stitch and this will keep the seam allowances folded back and in place. Now I'm just going to feed the satin cording in and it's just going in and out of the loops of the lace. After securing the one end in place, I'm giving a pull to the satin lacing just to slightly create some tension in the neckline. Here's where you'd want to try on this bodice to make sure that neckline comfortably fits around you. And once you've got that good, the second lacing end is secured in place. Moving on to the sleeves, I first made three pin tucks in the silk organza, and now I'm cutting out the underlay of Swiss dot netting. To hem the sleeves, I'm just doing a basic type of seam. I'm first aligning right sides together and sewing the seam, and then turn it and put wrong sides together and get it ironed in place. And then I'm just doing a top stitch basically about a quarter inch away from the folded edge. And this is securing the layers together, but also creating a channel for the elastic to be placed in. Before moving on to the elastic, I'm first going to place my slight smocking detail at the top of these sleeves. I'm doing four lines of hand sewn stitches and then just slightly gathering them up and then securing those thread ends so that that gathering stays in place. Moving on to the elastic, using this fat old looking needle, it's my mom's and it's the only one that would really fit the elastic in it, but I'm feeding the elastic cord through that hemmed edge and securing the edges of elastic to give it some gather. Now these cap sleeves are attached to the armhole, which also has piping along them. For these sleeve seams, I've decided to serge the edge and then press the seams towards the sleeves. Um, since the sleeves have an extra layer with the netting, it hides the seam fairly well. Moving on to the lace flowers and netting along the neckline, I first cut out the flowers, which is a fairly easy process, and then I got my netting piece. So here's where I actually didn't film the real process, and so this is just a quick representation of what I did. But this netting piece would actually be a piece which goes around the entire neckline, so it would be a lot larger than this. But anyway, um, I placed the netting in an embroidery hoop um, to keep it slightly stable, and then I pin on the flowers. And then there's just quite a bit of hand sewing around the bottom edge of the flower and the leaves to secure each little flower in place. I found that you don't want the netting to be too tight in the embroidery hoop because ultimately it will just stretch the netting out and when you take it off it'll just be pretty misshapen. So the hoop is just to help keep the netting enough in place to work with it. Once that's finished, you then feed a piece of navy 8th inch satin ribbon through the flower centers. This piece is then aligned to the bodice and the netting lower edge is secured to the seam allowances of the solid part of the bodice and the sleeve armholes. The next thing is I place a cotton lining along the solid parts of the bodice and then clasps along the waist. For the center front closure, I placed hooks and eyes, and then the 14 shell buttons.
Before moving on and talking about the skirt, let's quickly talk about some gloves that you see her wear in the movie. The gloves are made of Swiss dot netting and I paint stripes on this fabric. So I created a striped template which is made out of a plastic sheet of some sort. This would be a much better template if it was a thicker plastic, but I just used what I had and it does the trick. So I place the template on the fabric and tape it in place. And then I just use a basic fabric paint, mix it up to be a light blue, and use a foam brush to paint it on. So the netting is a slightly weird fabric to get to be painted. And so you don't wanna really brush against it because it just moves the fabric out of place. So I found a dabbing process is the best way to get the paint on that netting. Once it's been painted, I take off the template and move the netting to a clean sheet of paper and let it dry. So they're not the most even lines, but I think it just feels right for these gloves and it works. The next thing I do is just give it a quick hem, just a quick turn of the edge, and then top stitched in in place. And then I place some snaps along the edge. You could also use Velcro or hooks and eyes for this. And the final touch is the placement of three buttons on each glove. All right, so now that we've made the bodice for this Alice in Wonderland dress, I'm now just gonna talk a little bit about the skirt and how I made that and such. So there's three layers to this skirt. We've got this outer silk organza layer, and then just a plain gourd uh, poly taffeta skirt layer. And then uh, the third one is basically the same structure as this one, but it has a ruffled edge along the bottom. And that's, that's just to add some more volume to the whole skirt. And then also just based on some photos, you can kind of see that other layer underneath. It could be just another petticoat worn like over or under these top two layers. So those extra ruffles, hems you see underneath the skirt could just be a fully separate um, petticoat but I chose to just kind of build it into this outer skirt just to make it simpler and also I already have this petticoat that goes underneath it um, so I didn't want to make another one so anyway three layers um, this outer layer is pretty uniquely pleated along the top um, at, at the waist. So it's just the silk organza layer that's getting pleated here. And it's kind of a combination of box pleats and regular pleats. I just based my pleating on the pictures of the dress. Um, as it goes around to the back, we just get some smaller box pleats and then it slowly gets bigger towards the front. And then the center front kind of is just plain with no pleats. If you buy my pattern, I'll have a pleating diagram of how to pleat this outer skirt. Um, the other two layers of the skirt are just smooth at the waist. So pretty easy and simple. Um, then the most probably unique part about this lower or outer skirt, the silk organza skirt, is the fact that it has this part. We have this tear attached, which has been gathered and attached to this section. So from photos, I really didn't see a hemmed edge on this gathered edge. Um, and so I chose to use the salvage edge on my silk organza and pleated or gathered it right along that salvage edge. And that way I didn't have to worry about finishing this edge. Um, another dress, I, since I made it um, a second one of these, I actually, I didn't have a salvage to work with. So I ended up just folding it about a half inch down and then gathered it. So it was like a folded edge right here. I don't think it looked quite as accurate to the original as this method, um, but you can choose what you want and you might not have the correct salvage edge to do that. So that's just an idea. And then of course we've got the detail at the bottom. This is all embroidery and I do have that for sale. Um, I hesitated selling this pattern for a while because it was my first digitizing project but also there's this matter of having to line up all the different repeats and 
for the most part, you can get it pretty well, um, but there's just gonna be some of those little fabric stretch errors that where this bottom line doesn't line up. Um, and I did have quite a few of those along the whole hem, but I just ended up going with my machine, um, like my regular sewing machine, and I did tiny little zigzags to basically fill in any gaps that I got between each repeat. And so on this repeat, um, there are seven repeats going along the skirt. And each repeat has a, a bird, and then a flower, a squirrel, then a flower, a deer, then a flower, and a bunny, and then a flower, and then it restarts. So you basically have four flowers and then four different animals in each repeat. So my pattern includes separate files for each section like this. So it has a flower and one of the animals pattern. And then the next file has a flower and the next animal and so on and so forth. So it's just a matter of placing your fabric and then doing one file, the next, the next, and the next, and then repeating that process. It's a pretty simple embroidery design. It's just basically an outline. This was my best, it was to the best of my ability that I could create this pattern just because it's hard to find clear photos of the skirt. So that's what I ended up with. I think it looks great. Um, and then it just has a tiny rolled hem on the very edge. Um, a trick for embroidering the skirt is to leave or to cut your fabric about six inches longer than you actually want it to. And then you have the ability to really sew this well or embroider it well onto the fabric. Because if you have your raw edge like right here and you're trying to embroider right here, it's it just doesn't have enough fabric to for the hoop to hold on to when you're embroidering it. So just remember to cut your fabric longer than you want and then you can trim it off once all the embroidery is done. Okay, so going on to the, the next layer, it's basically just a gorge skirt with a tiny rolled hem. And then on this one, I just guessed, and again, just kind of did a gourd shorter skirt and attached a frill along the edge. So really basic, um, really pretty basic design. And then we, of course, got the bars um, along the waistband, which um, the bodice has clasp that will attach to these, and that'll keep the two pieces together. Um, and the closure is in the center back. And that's about it for the skirt. Again, you can find the pattern for that um, in the link below. And then we've got this petticoat, which is striped. And I had the hardest time figuring out how, like finding fabric that had the correct amount of stripe to it and width and everything. Um, but this is a, let me remember, okay. It basically has three edges to it, which I, based on studying photos, that seemed to be the correct amount of edges of striped going around inside the skirt. Um, but I created it out of only two full layers. Um, so we've got this outer layer, which is basically a gourd skirt with a, um, a ruffle attached to the bottom. And each ruffle is hemmed with a bias um, binding basically about an inch and a half wide. And again, this is just based on photos. You see that biased edge instead of a straight stripe. Um, so I did that on all my ruffled edges. Um, then the second skirt to save on money because this is silk taffeta, um, I just used a basic like poly fabric to create the second layer. And then from here I have two, I've got a, like a little tear off it and then this is just the full skirt. So basically it's a second full skirt with a little extra tier added to it. So that I have three edges at, at the end of it. Um, so each of those layers, just basically um, gourd pieces, making it all up. And then the ruffle, which is cut on the straight and bias sewn to the edge. So there's a lot of bias binding to add to all these hem edges, but it really makes the difference. I just seen that angled um, striped going around in the petticoat and in three different layers is just really fun. With that, I think that concludes my making process of this Alice in Wonderland down the whole blue dress, whatever you wanna call it. And you can find the finished video featuring this dress. Um, I'll link it above and below. But other than that, that's all I've got on the making 
um, this dress. I do have another Alice in Wonderland dress that I made, and that's the Queen of Hearts one. I made that and put videos all about the making of that, so I'll put the playlist for you to watch if you like Alice in Wonderland. <sighs> I didn't take enough breath, guys. Now, I think that's all, so if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe for more videos like this. My channel has been a little bit dry as far as no videos for the last, like, three months, but it's changing. Thankfully, it is changing. I'm getting more motivated and getting stuff done. The Cinderella work dress is coming. I am working on it. It's over there, partially worked on. Um, but that'll be next, so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you all for sticking around, even through this no video season. And as always, a huge thank you to my patrons who, again, have stuck through, like, this through with me. <laughs> that was a bad sentence. Um, like during this time of basically no videos and updates and stuff. They've been just trying to find motivation and everything. So thank you patrons for sticking with me and I will see you in the next video.